Hi everyone, Alexander here again for our final daily installment of 30 Days of Symphony. Well, as we are now, musically speaking, at the letter D in our alphabet and have been celebrating the work of one of the very greatest of all French composers, Claude Debussy, there's no better work with which to end our daily dose of the greatest symphonic repertoire than the work, well, one of really three or four pieces that has made Debussy forever a household name and truly his symphony in all but name, the work he called La Mer, the Sea. Yesterday we were celebrating his kind of earlier non-symphonic -symph symphony, um, the work that just dates from a few years before the 1905 completion of La Mer, the three nocturnes for orchestra very much for symphony orchestra, but actually rarely performed outside of the biggest cities because a performance of that piece requires, not in the whole work, but only in its last movement, <clears throat> the talents of a wordless female chorus. So unless you're doing the work as a first half to a double bill with that other very famous piece from the early 20th century that requires a wordless female chorus, and, and those of you who are Die-hard music fans know the work to which I'm referring, Gustav Holst's symphonic panoply, The Planets, in the very last movement, then Debussy's Nocturnes gets actually quite rarely performed these days. The work we're going to celebrate now, of course, does not have that problem and is, <clears throat> again, along with the Nocturnes and the work which in 1894 really you could say literally began modern music, his prelude to the afternoon of a fawn, the work that most often makes Debussy's name known in the concert halls is, of course, La Mer, as he called them his three symphonic sketches, in each depicting the many moods of the ocean, the sea. Now, Debussy loved to kind of play around with people when it came to words and terminology. <clears throat> and throughout his life, he rejected the term of being called, labeled a, an impressionist composer. He somehow thought it was demeaning, but I think this was completely hypocritical because Debussy <clears throat> was very much the musical inheritor of the great tradition of French impressionist painting established by, among many other great painters, uh, most, most famously by Claude Monet, that painter who, among many, many masterpieces, gave us those famous uh, depictions of water lilies. And also, uh, what's very important is that, to note is that Debussy, throughout his life, refused to call La Mer a symphony, but he even confidentially said now and then to intimate friends that, well, it kind of was a symphony, and it is a symphony. It's a symphony, okay? Just one more time, it's a symphony. He just, being so, you know, arch-modern a figure in Paris in the early 20th century, he just thought it would be kind of frumpy and traditionalist to officially term it a symphony. But it is a symphony. It is a symphony in three movements that by this point was kind of a well-established form in French music. Remember the symphony of César Franck, who actually was his teacher when he was a student at the Paris Conservatory. The, the symphony of Franck's great um, protege um, and student who actually, since he was a, a gentleman composer, actually a, a great one, but um, didn't need to write music for a living and was one of actually the early supporters of the young, struggling Claude Debussy. I'm, I'm referring to the great composer Ernest Chausson, his symphony in B-flat, a gorgeous, gorgeous work written in kind of emulation of the symphony of César Franck, his teacher, is also a glorious and perfect and perfectly satisfying symphony in three movements. So Debussy is absolutely following in that tradition. And Again, he had this way of kind of, um, kind of, you know, throwing a wet blanket on tradition and, and saying, you know, looking down his nose at it, but then at the same time kind of warmly paying tribute to it. Like the way he spoke about his teacher, César Franck, um, who, who, in whose celebrated organ improvisation class Debussy uh, was a student. He, he, he famously said of, of Franck, who could not have been 
less fashionable an artistic figure when compared to Debussy, the very uh, kind of scandalous young modern composer. He said of Franck, he said, every, every note by César Franck has a special, specific meaning which was, it's, like, it's one of the most beautiful things you can say about a composer. And that was typical of Debussy's kind of, uh, you know, at once removed kind of tribute to someone else who was in this great French tradition. So in that habit of his, he all but acknowledged that La Mer was indeed a symphony. He just refused to call it one. So again, this is a symphony in three movements in the style of Cesar Franck. And there's actually a little interesting quote at the end which ties it all together, which I'll get to in a few in a few minutes. As with the Nocturnes, written just four or five years before, Debussy sought to give, I, I know he would hate it if I used this term, to give symphonic impressions of certain phenomena, certain kind of eternal truths in the human experience. And in the Nocturnes, remember, it's a depiction of the gentle you know, flowing of clouds across the sky, and then uh, some distant festival on a summer evening. And then the third, he calls them sirens. He calls the last one sirens after those beautiful, beautiful mermaids of Greek mythology, but they're actually, um, the movement is, is just depicting the, the constant moods and rhythms of the sea. It's for, in that, style that Debussy gives us another descriptive kind of program symphony, if you will. And even more than in Nocturnes, this is a thoroughly modern symphony in which the form of the symphony, the three movements of this descriptive, programmatic, impressionistic symphony, um, the form is dictated by the content of the music itself. Motives are sprung from the composer's genius, and then instantly get, they, they start to be developed and combined. And there is a, a sense of recapitulation. You do hear great ideas again, but not the ways that you expect to. And it, it really is thoroughly modern in something he established back in 1894 with the prelude to the afternoon of a fawn. This way in which you have to, when you listen to Debussy's music, you have to listen to Debussy's music the way you listen to any modern or, or especially any contemporary music. You simply have to close your eyes, as it were, and listen for where the music takes you. Again, because the form, the content, the, the form is dictated by the content. The form of the music is dictated by the shape and the development of the composer's ideas. It doesn't fit into any traditional sonata form style, the way that begins with Haydn and Mozart in the middle 18th century and really reaches its culmination with those massive, grandiose, kind of alpine dimensioned symphonies of the late 19th century Austrian composer Anton Bruckner. This is something completely different. Debussy, it's like it's like he's it's like he's wiped the floor. He's polished the floor to an elegant sheen, but in do in polishing the floor, he's wiped away all the traditions and is creating one of a new one, really, uh, creating traditions of his own that are still followed to this day. So this is a as a descriptive, impressionistic, don't mind Debussy not <laughs> allowing us to use that term, an impressionistic program symphony in three movements, three, as he did say, symphonic sketches. And here again, in using the term sketch, the trois equis symphonique, the three symphonic sketches, he is again, as I've said over, over these days that we have together, Composers are constantly making signals with their works. Debussy, in using the term sketches, is linking himself to the great watercolor tradition of French Impressionist painting. It's even most tellingly um, made in Debussy's personal choice of the cover art 
for the first edition, the first printed edition of the score of La Mer in 1905. The cover of the first edition score of La Mer is a reproduction of the immortal early 19th century Japanese print by um, Hokusai, the great, he's like the Camille Koro of early 19th century Japanese printmaking. You know, Koro was this genius of the lithograph. Hokusai was the great genius of the woodblock print. And if you know anything about Asian art, the most the most kind of important work of 19th century Asian art is Hokusai's set of woodblock prints that he called 36 Views of Mount Fuji. And it's at the Paris Exhibition of 1900. Every 11 years, Paris would have what we would call a World's Fair, this international exposition. And what the runaway hit of the 1900 Paris International Exposition was the Japanese Pavilion. And Debussy, like every important composer and artist of Paris in 1900, wanted to um, ingest Japanese art, the style of Japanese painting and, and printmaking and, and theater, uh, the Kabuki theater, you know about that, wanted to include this spirit into his own work. And the French even adopted a stylistic term for it. They called it Japonisme. And you see it in a lot of um, late 19th and early 20th century French art, these, these light, gorgeously light uh, color schemes and these very, this kind of intentionally flat sense of perspective. So the most famous of Hokusai's 36 views of Mount Fuji are a print, an image that you have seen, even if you don't, even if you've never heard of Hokusai, you have seen this image. It's a print that he called the Great Wave off Kanagawa, this epochal vision of like the, this tidal wave, you know, hitting the coast of Japan. It's, it's an unbelievable image. It's like, it's like, the Beethoven Fifth Symphony of 19th century uh, Japanese art. And Debussy went out of his way to get a reproduction of Hokusai's Great Wave of Kanagawa as the cover of the first edition score of La Mer. So here again, Debussy is being so French, following in this, whether he, whether he acknowledges it or not, musically following in the great uh, new tradition of French Impressionism in painting, but he gives it this international sheen by adopting this, just this iconic image of Japanese art as the cover of the score. Again, it, it sends a very, very clear signal to his audience. So Debussy is bringing in his own French tradition that he inherits from people like his teacher, César Franck at the Paris Conservatory. He's also in bringing in the great tradition of Russian ballet. Debussy is a young man. Um, actually, this is a, one of the great interesting factoids of late 19th century music. He spent two years as the house pianist for Nadezhda von Meck, who is the legendary patroness of Pyotr Ilyich Tchaikovsky, a composer she never met. They never met, but she was his devoted friend and, and his longtime patron. So Debussy brings in the spirit of the great Russian, those great pictorialist, orientalist, Russian nationalist composers, especially Rimsky-Korsakov and the, the Rimsky-Korsakov of Scheherazade. And then he brings in this great influence of Japonisme, those, those clean, clear, flat textures from Japanese art. You do feel them in the music. He brings it all together in this, again, program symphony in all but name, this symphony in three movements. The three titles themselves are very descriptive. The first movement is called From Dawn to Midday on the Sea. The second movement, quite simply, The Play of the Waves. And the third movement, the dialogue of the wind and the sea. And remember those titles because you really do hear and feel and in a video performance like 
we're going to share, uh, see them in a performance of this music. There is no more evocative, immediately evocative composer than Claude Debussy. One simply doesn't exist. And if the nocturnes, which we shared yesterday, were your kind of your fiber your, <laughs> to get to know and love musical French Impressionism, then the dessert is most definitely Debussy's La Mer, his three symphonic sketches depicting the many, many moods, the eternal moods of the sea. I can't think of a better performance um, to share with you than that conducted by another of the very greatest French composers of all time, the great composer and conductor, uh, the French composer and conductor of the late 20th and early 21st centuries, uh, a gentleman who was both music director of the New York Philharmonic and principal guest conductor of our Chicago Symphony Orchestra, that great late French musician, Pierre Boulez, here in 1992, he conducts his former orchestra, the ever amazing New York Philharmonic in Debussy's La Mer. <laughs> 